Welcome to another edition of Ed Talks. I have my friend, Dr. Suchi Serio with us. She is the founder and chief scientific officer of Bayesian Health. Suchi, welcome to Ed Talks. Thank you for having me, Ed. I love having entrepreneurs and super interesting people, and you definitely fit the mold for both of that. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, let's see. I grew up in India. I came here when I was 17. I had literally never traveled abroad. And so it meant carrying gobs and gobs of stuff here by myself, alone, figuring out what needed to happen. And that's been the story of the rest of my life. Uh, I'm a professor in AI and health at Johns Hopkins. I've worked in AI for a little over 20 years. Also spun uh, Bayesian Health out of um, almost a decade of research we did at Hopkins to turn this into a company. Extremely passionate about the company. Happy to share a little bit more about it if you're curious. Yeah, no, for sure. And I thought it was interesting too, in terms of your background, you've been doing AI forever. A lot of times people think AI is like brand new. Uh, but you're actually this this expert uh, in AI, been doing it for a long time. So I would love some other time to just go deeper into that history with you. But yeah, you're you're now a professor and you've been professing for a long time. What what's what's that like? Yeah, let me tell you a little bit about the history of it. What what's been really interesting is the field's been making extremely steady progress over the last two decades. Like when I first started, I started in pure robotics, pure core AI. This is like, um, there was a shift happening towards building, going from expert systems to learning algorithms. And in the last 15-ish years, we've gone from learning algorithm, like the power of the algorithms we're using has been steadily going up to learn more from more complex models with more complex data sets, with more complex learning techniques. This latest and greatest uh, iteration we're seeing is basically with transformers. The early papers started to come out around 2017, 2018, showing how these massive, massive models, formal-based models that could be trained with complex data sets. And one very big unlock that happened was our ability to build uh, these kinds of models from natural language data, where what we were able to do prior versus what transformer-based models can do is completely game-changing. One of the things that we're doing in the lab is, uh, you know, in my lab, is taking multimodal trans transformers, getting it to work not just with text data, but multimodal data. So like when you look at text and labs and virals and history and codes, think of this as like ultimately in healthcare, just text data alone isn't going to get you anywhere. And there's a lot of complexity attached to that. So that's sort of the latest and greatest on the AI research front. The next piece of it, which is super interesting also on the AI research front is around how do you translate these models in a way that drive trust and adoption? And so we've been leading a huge program with NSF called the Future of the Workforce. And in particular, the part of the workforce that we've been very fascinated by is clinical workforce, where the stakes are higher, there's more demands on your time, and you have very like you know specific expert type tasks you're looking to do. And the question is, how do you design machines in a way that you can augment these kinds of care teams to be way more effective? And related to that, to be able to then start to translate these tools in practice, I've been part of a center of excellence funded by the FDA, again, through my research at Hopkins, looking at, you know, how do you monitor these kinds of tools? What's best practice for deploying these kinds of tools safely at the point of care? And at Bayesian, you know, it's really bringing all these three pieces together, state-of-the-art AI combined with best-in-class translation combined with oversight, monitoring, and tooling so that it becomes easier for, you know, health systems, even if they have, without needing a big dedicated team of experts to be able to bring it to use in a variety of applications. Yeah, no, it's, it's super, super interesting. And in all this time, you also have found the ability to be a founder. So tell us a little bit about Bayesian Health. Yeah, so what Bayesian is doing is basically, you know, if you look at health systems, right, they've gone through and they've implemented the EMR, and now they're sitting on troves and troves of data. Simultaneously, from a business standpoint, like the last 10 years have been really, really tough on them from the point of view, like, you know, we're talking about staff clinician shortages, like many of our system partners will say our nursing workforce is the most inexperienced it's ever been. We don't have enough nurses to do the things we need to do. We're also seeing a looming physician shortage coming ahead. Simultaneously, patients are only becoming more complex in terms of who are the kinds of people we end up admitting and how long they're in there and their needs. So we just can't Business as usual isn't going to get out of this issue. We need the ability to augment our frontline care teams to be able to do more with less, to be able to be more efficient and more effective. And the question is, can AI do that or is it just another promise? And I think to me, in the last five-ish years, we're starting to see a number of areas where you have real high-quality peer-reviewed data to support that AI can really become a part of the care team 
and dramatically accelerate and augment the care team. And this is moving beyond, say, you know, we're already starting to see the promise and dictation where, you know, they can transcribe a note to what Bayesian is doing is pulling together structured, unstructured, comprehensive, multimodal data, making sense of it real time and moving smart workflows that allows the care team to do the right thing more easily. So one big example, I lost my nephew to sepsis. It's an area I'm extremely passionate about. I've you know, spent in the research end almost a decade of work here and Bayesian brings it to life. It's taking all this disparate data, crunching it real time to identify patients at risk. At a system like Johns Hopkins and massive studies, we showed almost 5.7 hour earlier detection on aggregate from these leading experts where they care a lot about safety quality. And these were cases where we know we can move the needle because they were cases during who were in the system who died, who had sepsis, right? 5.7 hours early and every hour matters. So now AI is now finding them early, flagging them. So the next question people would say is, yeah, sure, we can identify it. The question is, will physicians act? So the next big study we did, and all of these came out in Nature Medicine and on the cover of Nature Medicine, if you are uh, happy to send pointers, uh, if people want to follow up, what we showed was 4,400 clinicians using the platform, 90, 89% physician adoption, 89% means when a system flags a case, people go in, they look at the result, they agree, disagree, and they act if they agree, right? That's unbelievable because historically with AI and technical clinical CDS type tools, people have had 15, 10, pretty bad adoption. So now you can build it in a way they'll use. And of course, if you can show the earlier detection, flagging, they then you see the outcomes, right? Mortality reduction, morbidity reduction. Now, one thing people will say is, did you see this just because of the smarts of earlier detection? Turns out in order to really get it to work, you had to support the clinician team end to end. So we weren't just doing the flagging. It was the flagging, the documentation, the reporting, the abstraction, the compliance, what it takes to bring the full team together. And you can now, through automation augmentation, simplify it to a point where for any team, whether it's a big hospital or a community hospital, it's easy to do the right thing. I love it because this actually, we talk about this all the time, but we don't do enough. And that is, this actually saves people's lives, improves quality of care. And I, I have stories I could relate to as well on a personal level where something like this would have been a game changer. So I, I'm so happy that you've had all these years and years of study as a professor and all the research and all this AI background and found a great, great use case that, that has been adopted by uh, a couple of different health systems already and, and making a big impact. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Any ideas that you would have or any suggestions you would have for, for anyone watching and, you know, they, they see the AI and they see AI, you know, like you said, sort of the highest profile use case right now is, is what's going on in terms of uh, nurse experience and physician experience and ambient type things. What should they study? What, what should they be doing to prepare themselves for this new world so they could take advantage of tools like uh, what you've developed? I think there's the two types of stakeholders, right? Ultimately, when we're looking at the clinical work workforce, there's frontline clinicians who are giving care every day. And then there are administrators who are trying to figure out the strategy for how should they design the system in order to be survive and to be a high performing system. For the former, I think there's such an opportunity. I already see so much hunger from the former, right? In fact, one of the things that's leading to this revolution is the fact that AI tools, they could just go to ChatGPT and started using it. So even if they didn't have access to it, people started using it and it helps system administrators realize, actually, my clinicians are not the barrier. They're eager to adopt. They need tools to make their lives easier. So keep doing that, right? Learn about studies, identify ways to partner. I think people are sometimes worried about like losing jobs. And I, what I often remind them is of the many, many times previously where we've had similar new advents where it's really here, at least a lot of the work I'm seeing that's been very exciting, both through Bayesian and otherwise, are all around augmentation. How do we make your jobs easier so that you can practice at the top of your license? So that's really, to me, the exciting opportunity. For administrators, I think there's such, like when we're tackling, you know, the kinds of problems we're tackling with Bayesian, one way we think about it is we see 100 plus opportunities from the top where today there's unwarranted variation that has then huge impact on length of stay. Huge impact in terms of how we're using our workforce today. We have hundreds of CYA workflows that they've implemented for malpractice risk reasons. There's an opportunity here to bring AI in that understands your data, identifies critical moments where patients can be triaged according to risk. People can then put targeted workflows in place and you can save your people a huge amount of time. But you can also then experience the benefit from a capacity reduced risk profile and improved overall finances as a result. Yeah. 
No, it, it is amazing. And Bayesian Health is a great example of everything you're just uh, describing. And Suchi, thank you for spending a few minutes with us and sharing uh, your experiences. Thank you for having me, Yuet. It's always a pleasure to speak with you.